Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in just a second. I'm just going to wait to let all of you join the room. In the meantime, if you can hear me, okay, just pop a yes into the chat box for me. Fantastic, thank you very much. Lots of you saying yes, so you can all hear me, which is wonderful. My name's Rachel Jeffries. Welcome everybody to this first um, webinar in our Mondays with Cambridge event. Fantastic, lovely to see you all. So before we get started with today's talk, with our very exciting talk today, just to go through um, a few things about the webinar. If you have any problems with sound or audio at any time, please just click the reconnect button at the top, okay? That usually helps you with any problems that you have with sound or audio. I've got my colleagues, Andrea, Mark, Alex, and Frankie in the chat box there, okay? So they're there to help you if you should have any issues, but please, if it's a sound or audio issue, please just hit that reconnect button. For your certificate of attendance, at the end of today's webinar, we're gonna share a document with you all with some links, and one of those links will be for you to be able to register for your certificate of attendance, okay? So just hang on for the end, and we'll share that information with you. And finally, just move myself out of the way. Let's just keep that, try and keep that chat box free for any comments or questions related to the talk today, okay? Um, we are gonna have time at the end of the talk today to um, put some of your questions to Andrea. So if we can try and keep that chat box free for us to be able to see those questions, that would be wonderful. So, let me uh, kick off today's event then. And I have the greatest pleasure of introducing Andrea Zafiraku. I think Andrea is there now. She's going to turn on her camera for us. Hello, everyone. Hi, Hi, Hi Rachel. <laughs> so just a little brief introduction. I'm delighted to welcome Andrea. Andrea teaches at Alperton Community School in Brent, London with over 130 languages spoken at the school. It's one of the most culturally diverse places in England with children coming from some of the poorest families in Britain. Andrea's influence and contribution to her school is vast. From redesigning the curriculum from scratch across all subjects, helping a music teacher launch a Somali school choir and working alongside the senior management team to help better understand the lives of the children and their parents, among so many others. In 2018, from an initial field of over 30,000 nominations, Andrea was selected as the Global Teacher Prize winner. She shared the success with her colleagues and students at Alperton, and not long after, she set up the charity foundation, Artists in Residence, with the mission of inspiring young minds to explore pathways to careers within the creative and cultural industries. We had the pleasure of welcoming Andrea to an event in Santiago, Spain, a couple of months ago. And Andrea, you really left an impression on both us, the Cambridge University Press team, and the teachers who attended. Andrea's enthusiasm and passion for teaching is undeniable. And of course, her message is adamant. Teaching really is all about relationships. I could go on, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna let Andrea tell her story. So with great pleasure, Andrea, it's over to you. Thanks so much, Rachel. Gosh, what a wonderful introduction. It's so lovely to, yeah, actually it feels really strange, but apparently there's a thousand of you um, in this conference. I just wanna say thank you for taking the time um, to be, to join me, to join, me, to join us, um, because it's just quite an extraordinary moment in our history. And um, what you will hear a lot from me uh, throughout this whole conference for the next 45 minutes is how absolutely incredible this profession is, 
how amazing it is in terms of what difference we are making to our young people and the fact that you know we're just so resilient we will bounce and come back we are strong and we're the ones that are more or less keeping our country going keeping the 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 mindfulness keeping the the capacity of learning of education going in our countries so over the last two years all i can say is that i my life has changed quite drastically quite amazingly and um it's just been quite an honor to reflect on this and when, when i was um, in spain a few months ago um you know again it was a case of oh my gosh this has really happened to me and what and what happened to me um was quite significant so as rachel mentioned i won the global teacher prize in march 2018 and it was um an award which has completely transformed my life simply because i was and has been a very, what I'd say, a normal teacher. My life was for the last 14 years going from my house to my school and back again. My car would do um, 14 miles a week. No more, no less, 14 miles a week. I knew exactly how much petrol to put in my car. Um, so my routine was the same, absolutely the same. Um, and I had a very low, you know, I worked in my school. Nobody knew. Nobody knows. If I said to him, do, do you know my school? Nobody knew about where Alperton was now. But the, the greatest thing is that it has actually changed and, and it's been quite amazing, the impact of the award. So I won the Global Teacher Prize and um, it was quite a strange moment in my life because I had no idea what happened I, I had no idea what the global teacher prize was and what it what it what happened was um a colleague of mine who i used to work with a very long time ago nominated me and um you know again it's going for that, that kindness somebody recognized what i did or what i was doing in my world and they nominated me for an award and again i was like oh no please there's no way i'm going to go for it come on and they're like no 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 Andrea, I, I think this is something that you that you fit the criteria for this award. I'm going to put your name down. Let's see what happens. Let's see. Um, and that was it. I forgot about it. They applied for me. And the funny thing was, the night before my wedding, so October 2017, I received an email um, saying to me, please, can you apply? And it was a reminder email. And so I I, um, I remember quickly popping downstairs and I was in the middle of, I had all my family from Greece coming to the UK, coming to my wedding. I was trying to sew up my my husband's trousers because obviously um, when he got them measured, somehow he grew or he shrunk. Um, so I was just fixing his trousers for him. Uh, and then I, and I quickly applied and I left, I left that moment. I just thought, right, that's it, I've done it. You know, my friend applied for me. I've managed to apply back, so that's it. I doubt I'll hear it ever again. And in um, and in uh, Christmas, so December the 13th, I found out I was in the top 50. Um, in February, I found out I was in the top 10. Um, and I think that's when really my life changed because these were the, the, the colleagues that I was there with. These people are incredible. They are um, teachers from all over the world. They were in the, in the top 10 with me. Again, I found it quite difficult because the question I always get asked is, you know, why do you think you won? Why do you think you won? That answer is very difficult for me to, to explain to you. Um, could it be could it be the way that um, that I'm passionate for my subject that I've seen how my children have really make a huge a tremendous difference by going by being taught the arts? Is it because um, I, I I care about them, my students, the fact that they've got so many issues, the dangers they confront every single day is just by coming to school, making sure that they're still in. Is it that? Is it the fact that I'm there to help as many teachers as I can through my role, through being um, in charge of professional development? What, what was it? I still don't know. But for me, what was the most important thing about winning this particular role was two huge facts. Number one, it was an award won by an art teacher. Who would imagine an art teacher winning an award, winning the greatest teacher or the, or the Global Teacher Prize? Uh, that for me is shocking because the main thing about that is the arts in my country, in many countries, are the first subjects to be pushed aside. They're not important. They're not seen as being important. And for me, that realization that, oh, my God, people are people can see it. People can see how the arts do 
support, transform, um, help our young people is something that, ha that I feel really, really proud of. And that's why I've just been so grateful for winning that award for that reason. And the second thing is the fact that what it's done for my community. So this is my particular community here. Um, I, I, as Rachel said, I work in a community in the London Borough of Brent. And, and to be honest with you, um, Brent is one of the boroughs at the moment which has got the highest amount of deaths in terms of COVID. Um, it is highly populated, very dense, very multicultural, and obviously highly deprivated. Um, there's high levels of deprivation there. But the thing that is quite incredible about my school is my students, the fact that regardless of their own circumstances, regardless where they live, regardless of the poverty they're experiencing, regardless of the trauma they're experiencing, the school is theirs. They love school, they come to school, and they feel part of a huge, huge community. Now, if you can imagine, in my school, um, the white British children are the minority. As Rachel said, we have approximately 130 different languages spoken in my school. And one of the challenges we had was trying, it is, not just had, but is, is always, is trying to make sure that this is a community, that we, that we integrate all these young people. And one of the reasons where I'm really grateful for is the fact that my school support the arts. And it's the arts that I feel are the key subjects to do this um, work for us, is to bring our communities together. And the reason for this is quite simply, there is no language barriers in the arts. There's none. Everyone can draw, everyone can paint. You don't have to communicate, even with music. Music, um, you can communicate through music. It doesn't matter what language you're speaking. So these are absolute powerful subjects. And I'm hoping by the end of this presentation, I'm going to convince you too. So this is my wonderful world. Now, what makes a great teacher? I, I, I often get asked that question. And for me, the, the, the thing that I, I find is very, very important being a teacher is not how much you read, how much you know your subject, but actually what you learn from the young people in your who are in your classrooms. And I think that I'm a good teacher because of what I have learned from some of these stories I'm going to be telling and talking to you now. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to a student of mine called Raf. Raphael came to our school um, when he was in year nine. So he was approximately 13, 14 years old. And he came from a special educational needs school, a very small community. His family thought that he would be able to um, integrate and he was ready to go into a mainstream school. Now, I think I was in my second year of teaching there and I was, and I was really nervous about this because Raph, he had many um, special educational needs, but I think one of the most important, one of the most stressful ones was the fact that he was selected mute, so he couldn't talk. And I remember when I was meeting his mum his, and his parents, his parents like, look, you know, we know he's not going to achieve, we know he's not going to get any GCSEs, we understand that, but we want him to come into a normal school. And I just thought, oh, okay, so his parents don't even think that this child is capable. And that was quite interesting for me because it's this, this idea of, of having high expectations, which we will revisit. So Raf came into my classroom and um, he came in and I will never forget he had he, he was absolutely terrified. He was shaking. You know, this child was so used to being in a very small school with a, at least five children in his class. But now he's coming to a school whereby there's 26, seven people in his class. And he came in and um, he, he, when I asked him, how are you? No, nothing. Just face down you know almost trembling he came he sat down um during that class we were doing a drawing exercise um and i thought i'm just not i'm gonna leave raf to it here's a pencil here's a paper off you go raf and at the end of the lesson i said to the class what i'd like you to do everyone is draw for me an object that you are that you love that you really enjoy now normally when i when i set this homework i get about you know hundreds of pictures of footballs or cricket bats or playstations. I went round the classroom to collect the homework and I went to see Raf and Raf said, uh, when I went to ask Raf, I was like, Raf, can I have your homework? And he said, he didn't say anything. He was just quiet like that and he just shook his head. Now, obviously I was like, well, that's just unacceptable. You know, that's, that's not great. How dare anyone not do homework for me? But obviously 
you know, understanding that Raf came from a very different community, you know, I thought, no, I'll have a talk with him later. So at the end of the class, I was, you know, the majority of the students who had gone, they'd packed up, they've left, and I was just speaking to two girls in the corner of my room. I saw Raf, he came up quietly, and from the corner of my eye, I saw him put a piece of paper on my desk. I just did one of those kind of, and I looked at that paper, and what I saw changed my life. I can actually remember my face. I was like, <gasps> it was the most gorgeous picture of a guitar that was drawn with um, pencils, normal, normal lead pencils. And it was stunning. It was sensitive. It was accurate. The tone was right. And it must have taken him hours. Um, and I picked this up and I was just I was just taken away. And I just went, stop. Completely scared the poor kid. Stop. He froze faced in the door. I took this piece of paper and I went round to him to the front of him and I just said, Raf, did you do this piece of work? Again, no eye contact. Raf, did you do this piece of work? Because it is incredible. And he just nodded. And then I was like, okay, 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 right, that's it, that's it, right, okay, come with me, come with me. So this poor boy was traumatized by this crazy art teacher saying, come with me, I want to give you something. And what I did was I, I grabbed a plastic wallet for him and I loaded it up with um, pencils and coloring pencils and sheets of paper. Um, I, I, I grabbed an old um, sketchbook and I was like, right, draw, right, just go away, just draw for me five objects, five, anything you want, but five objects, five objects, because you can draw, you're brilliant. Do you understand, Raf? Five, five. And I go, Raf, five objects. And he just went like that. And I think the poor thing just wanted to leave as quickly as possible. The two girls over there who were waiting for me were like, Miss, are you okay? I was like, yes, it's just amazing. The guy can draw. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, on GCSE results day, Raf got a grade D. A grade D. He got a GCSE. I wasn't happy, though, because I found out he was three points away from a grade C. And if he did a grade, if he got a grade C, I mean, then he would have been able to sit A-levels in my school. I mean, the world, you know, that that's it. He would have been doing A-levels. How incredible. Then then your mind thinks, well, then he could go to art college. And then hey, maybe he could, you know, and so you're just thinking, oh, my God, he's three months away, three months away. So I went to see my head of department and I was just like, look, he's three months away. Shall we, what can we, shall, let, let's, 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 let's see if we can get him to do A-levels. Let's ask him. And so his mum was so happy. She came up to me and she was just hugging me. And Raf had a huge smile on his face. I go, how are you feeling? Miss, I'm feeling great. Brilliant. Brilliant. I go, Raf, we want to try and fight for you to do A-levels. And he goes, do you think I can do it? I go, yeah, we can. We can We can do this. And my colleague was there. And we were just really determined that we can try and see if this child could, could receive um, an A-level. And the picture you've got in front of you, the one that you're looking at, is his A-level final piece, one of his A-level final piece, where he was looking at self-portraits. And you can see there how he was influenced from Cubism, from Egon Schiele. So he was, his work is pretty incredible. And he got a grade A at the end of his A-levels. And the thing which is quite amazing, and the one, and whenever I get goose pimples and I talk to you about the story, is the fact that not only did he achieve brilliantly and he got his great uh, qualifications, but the fact is, the matter is that he doesn't now shut up. He talks. He used to come to the art room. He didn't have that kind of self-consciousness. He felt confident. He felt like this was his environment, that I can exceed. I can, I can do great things in this learning, in this art environment. And some of the gorgeous memories I have of Raf is um, the younger children coming up to him when he'd be sitting at the back of the class carrying on doing his work for his A-level. The kids would go up to him and just ask for his opinion. They'll just say, oh, can you just, you know, how can I get that shape better? And then Raf will go and help him. And I just, I think that's just the most beautiful thing that's happened through his journey. However, there's some other students who we come across whereby the art room and, and the art work is sometimes a cry for help. So for this particular student, Rima, um, she was what I'd call a ghost. She was one of those children that were just amazing, that did nothing wrong, never spoke, always did the homework. Um, never, they would never put their hand up because you know they were too they were too nervous to speak and just to to stand out in any way. Um, it was 
Rima's GCSE exam, this is her final piece from there. And the most interesting thing is about when you're doing a GCSE art exam is that you have 10 hours in the art room to produce a piece of work. And this is the piece of work that she that she produced. And, and what was really interesting was the fact that I could not believe it she made this. And the reason being is that her coursework, so her examination portfolio that led up to this work, a developmental work, paid no resemblance to this. I couldn't link it. And even when, again, the head of department, I said, have you seen this piece of work? He's like, wow, whose is this? And I said, it's Rima's. And then we were both quite confused, but quite, quite shocked. And, and he's like, well, you know, we've got to find out what's happening because this is powerful, but it's distressing. The next day we called Rima to come in and obviously she was terrified. Miss, what's wrong with my exam? Miss, is, you know, is anything okay? And we asked her, I go, look, Rima, this is just the most amazing piece of work, but what's it about? What's what's happening to you? And then that's when you kind of see, again, the telltales are, you know, the signals that teachers know. You know when the students pull down their sleeves and they're like this and they're, 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 they're trying to kind of not show the scars, the wounds which they have. And unfortunately, Rima was self-harming. So she was unfortunately going through quite a lot of self-torture. And the reason being was that, and what we discovered was that um, in two, when her GCSEs were finished, which was probably in about two months' time, um, her parents were then going to send her to um, uh, another Indian country where she was going to be um, betrothed to somebody else. So they were preparing her wedding for her at the age of 16. And she didn't want to go anywhere. She wanted to stay home. She wanted to be a nurse. That was her dream. She wanted to help people. We managed to, to put um, many interventions in place for Rima. And thankfully, she did stay on to do her GCSEs. Um, and she not only did she stay on to do GCSEs, but she she then went to Imperial College and she became a doctor. She started to become a doctor. And for me, what this piece of work I think was was her message to us that said, "I need help. Help me." Um, and that this is sometimes the way that artwork that we can we can sense pain, we can sense anxiety, we can sense trouble through children's work. I think that was a fantastic and very important message that I've learned from my teaching career. And then you've got students like Tom. Now, what can I tell you about Tom? Tom is one of those students that uh, if you see him on your register, you, ha you have panic attacks. <laughs> Tom is one of those students that like every teacher tries to avoid teaching if they can because he's, a, he's very aggressive. First of all, he's a year eight child, so he's around 12, 12 years old, 12, 13 years old. So he's quite aggressive. He's angry. He has ADHD. He has emotional um, problems. He has behavioral problems. His, fair, his parents are not really, what I say, effective, as I could say. They're not effective at all in his life. Um, he has dyslexia. Um, and, but the, the thing which is quite interesting about Tom is that he just had he could not communicate with young people. He he would only speak to teachers. He had this kind of this this feeling of not being able to connect. Um, in year eight, we study a portraiture project, and um, I take the students on a journey where we look at uh, cubism and we look at the weeping woman. And before every lesson, I normally take the pile of work and I said, right, okay, guys, so so look at this piece of work. So whose is it? Okay, I can see your name. Fantastic. Now, what can we do to improve? What what kind of comments can we can we suggest? How how we how we get how is he or she getting on? And so students would always say, oh, look, miss, look at the way he's, um, she's painted that. Miss, look at the way they've done the background. It's really accurate. So when I came to this piece of work, um, Tom's work in front of me, I picked it up and I was like, oh, no name, no name again. How many times have I told you no name? Anyway, so, oh, this looks good. OK, let's let's see. Let's let's start having a look at this piece of work. What can you tell me? And then I'd hear comments like, miss. I like the way that they've mixed that orange. It's a really good thickness of colour. Miss, I love the way they applied the, the, the outline. Miss, look how carefully they've done it. Miss, they've managed to have a really good, they've managed to complete the background in time. And um, I was really, really impressed with these comments. I was like, actually, you're absolutely right. It's a great piece of work. But whose is it? And then at the back of the class, you see Tom, his hands just creeping up like that. And the thing which I will never forget 
is the moment after that second after whereby the rest of the class saw my face when I was like Tom they turned around they saw him and they just clapped they were you know they were they were applauding it was like we've just won the FA Cup final or the World Cup final we they just celebrate they celebrated up here they celebrated Tom and at that moment Tom was a child who had no issues, felt confident and was just as good as everyone else. Just as good. Now for a child who always gets, that's not good enough, or that's a failure, or you've got zero out of 20, for Tom, he was just as good as anyone else. And that was his moment. From that moment on, I think Tom had changed significantly. He he did brilliant work. Um, I mean, I, I can't say the guy the, the guy is cured. He's not cured at all. He still gives us problems. He still he still sometimes does our head in. But what's been beautiful for me is that he feels again reconnected into a learning environment. So um, that's that's something that I learned about Tom: the fact that you never know what a child can achieve, um, and sometimes the labels they have do not define them. I get asked quite a lot of times, what do you think makes a great teacher? And I don't know what the magic ingredient is, but I think that something which is so key, so, so key now, and, and, and to be honest with you, I think it's going to be even more key now in the next few months when, when we start integrating our students back into schools, is the fact that we need to have relationships with our children. We need to know more about them. It can't just be a gap. We need to be able to connect with them. What football teams do they like? What music do they like? They need to know about us as well. Do we have children? What team do we support? What's our favorite food? You know, and having these relations because that's the only way that they will then feel comfortable about coming into your world, coming into your classroom and being open to everything that you share. And show the love. This is this is my plead for you, for teachers out there, to just show how much you love your subject. Show them that you that you live off your subject. The fact that um, I would say to them, "Oh my God, I painted this over the weekend. What do you guys think?" Or, um, "This is my sketchbook that I had when I was your age. What do you think about it?" Show them how much you're passionate about your subject, because they will be like sponge they'll absorb all that energy they will go and do their, their own research and, and they'll bring it in and say miss I saw this in the newspaper or miss I went to the gallery or miss I did this and it, that shows how much inspiring you can be the other thing is which is quite important is the kindness now I mean um, it goes without saying kindness yes of course but you know we are kind to our students but you know are we are we really kind to them you know, do we know what they have gone through on on their journey to school? Do we know some of the traumas they've had? And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is that I'm never, I'll never forget um, the fact that um, there was a young teacher in my school, and um, this a student who a student who more or less survives his week by himself because his mum is either on um, his single parent family, mum is never home or mum is very high. And yet he comes into school every single day. And, some, and for me, success is the fact that he woke up, he got dressed, he came into school, regardless of the fact that he's not learning, but he is in school because he feels safe. And I remember when a teacher, when he came into the classroom once and a teacher um, said why are you late get out you're late and I just thought oh my god he doesn't need that at this moment in time this child came in so my story my my, my I think my my tell here for you is just to kind of be aware that what you think they're experiencing at home is not always that it's not always true the fact that some of, some of our students have got the most challenging circumstances at home and that just by being into school them coming in okay they're late but coming in has really been a huge mammoth task for them so kindness is so important and then the last thing I'd like to share with you in terms of what I think makes a good teacher is having those high expectations with Raphael at the beginning I didn't have those high expectations when with Raphael I kind of didn't think he could achieve because he had so many special educational needs labels but the fact of him just 
blowing me away by his work. The fact that I knew that he could do GCSE, that I knew that we should put him for A-level, just blew my mind away. And I will never, ever, ever um, change that. I'll always think, right, let's push them more. What else can they do? What else can they achieve? And I think by, high and have, by having high expectations of your community um, is, is so key and so important. And I'm showing you this picture because this is actually my world. This is the world that I live in, that I work in. And the, the, the key for me is that I, I, there's no way I could have won the Global Teacher Prize if it wasn't for my school and my school supporting me, my school helping me um, just be the teacher that I want to be. And there's a lovely African proverb that says it takes a village to grow a child. And this is my village. This is my school community with all my colleagues and staff. Um, and I just want to share something with you. Um, I think it was um, uh, I think it was Christmas. No, it was last summer. Um, I was reading Alice in Wonderland to one of my children, um, and uh, there's a, a section in that book where it says, "One, uh, there is no use in trying," said Alice. "One can't believe impossible things." I dare say you haven't had much practice, a queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. While sometimes I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast that is the role the job of a teacher we do the most impossible things every single day we are nurses we are mentors we are counselors we plant seeds we inspire we try and get our young people from one area from one learning point to another effortlessly that's what we do we create the impossible and the reason why i'm saying that is because um i know and i, and I need you to all be listening to me now so you know really focus on what i'm going to say to you because it's really important i know that over the last two years since we're in the global teacher prize i know that um i have changed lives that i have um, affected decisions that I have inspired the children that I have taught thousands of children I've taught in the past I know that because they've come up to me and said miss we're so proud of you miss can you remember when you miss can you remember when you rang up my mum miss can you remember when you told me off well they, they they've come up and they've said that to me and they are proud of me and they've only done that because they they have seen me win this award but they have not done that to you but I just need you to be aware that there are thousands of children out there, thousands of, of young people who will say, the person that's changed my life is you. The person who's made the biggest difference was you. And it feels very strange, doesn't it? You know, it feels very strange to, to feel that kind of, that sense of power, but it, it's true. You know, there's not one person out there who would not say that the per the person who's changed their life was a teacher. And that's how incredible we are. That's how incredible this profession is. We change lives. It's a fact. We change lives. You change lives. And um, it's I mean, it's quite interesting because over the lockdown and we've been in lockdown for a few um, a few months now and there's been so much incredible um, um, information and 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 um, Rachel, just before you you we start twitching the change, just give me a second. Um, there's just been some incredible stories you've been hearing on Twitter right and these stories have been like um of um parents saying oh my god oh my god I'm homeschooling I don't know what to do oh the thank you teachers thank you teachers um and what's been really interesting is that we found now something which I think you'll find quite inspiring um and this is a parent um so Rachel when you're ready this is a parent who has um more or less um has been um calling out to say thank you to all the teachers across the world. Hope you enjoy this small little video clip.
Dear teachers, some of us parents want to say to you directly, we're sorry, okay? We're sorry for turning up to school late. We're one of those parents that we never reply when you send us a message. We're sorry for coming to school and haven't even dashed water in our face and we're talking in your face with our morning bread and sour self. We're sorry. We complain. You got six weeks on there. They need it. Teachers, you need the six weeks. You need the teacher training. It's not teacher training. It's let me stop myself from getting arrested because you can't box down people's children. There are children. We pushed them out and we found it hard to cope for the six weeks. We don't understand how you keep them entertained for six hours straight. Now, I, I couldn't I couldn't do it two hours. Why are they up in the morning so early on the holiday? But when it's time for school, they can't get up. But we drag them and send them to you and you have to cope. You have to cope. We're supposed to cope. So we want to say to you, we love you because some of you teachers, you're not just teachers, you're almost parents, general practitioners, nurses, counselors, police officers, social workers, and you're just the worst and we just want to say to you, we're sorry, we're sorry and we're going to appreciate you much more. Six, six weeks, I'm broke, I've lost weight, I've lost weight because there's no food in our they ate everything, they got to the stage when they were eating dry cereal. <laughs> We miss you, we appreciate We appreciate you, teachers. We appreciate you. Take it back. Take it back. Oh, I hope I hope you've all enjoyed that. I hope that you um had a right giggle there. There's some amazing kind of moments in it. I think for me the most important thing was the fact that um uh, was resonated to me is the fact that um when they when a parent comes up and sometimes they're quite aggressive and we we worry about them um but they were like we're really really sorry and the other thing is is that obviously with children at home the fact they're eating so much in my house that's what's happening i think all the kids are eating everything so um but uh, a wonderful little clip there just to celebrate us um, and celebrate teachers and what i think is quite interesting the fact that the fact that there's a there's a change in conversation about teachers at the moment. I'm not sure if you realise it, but things are changing and that's a positive thing. What we have achieved has been nothing short than a miracle in a space of sometimes less than 48 hours. We've changed from having um, from teaching in our classrooms into teaching online. We've been resilient. We're upskilling. We're trying to think, how can I help? How can I make things better for my young people? And don't get me wrong. I hate this new way. I can't, I hate teaching through a screen. I miss my classroom. I miss the smell of my of my room. I miss the mess. I miss the energy. I miss the noise. I miss sometimes telling them off. I miss sometimes celebrating. I miss the headaches. I miss it. I, I wasn't, I didn't come into the profession to teach through a screen. But what we're doing at home is quite amazing. We're working at home. We're providing resources for our for our young people at home. We're staying, you know, we're upskilling ourselves. We're learning all these new systems, these new platforms. You know, who else would do that? Just the teachers. So I won. Oh, by the way, did I tell you I won a million dollars for this award? So it came with a million dollars, believe it or not. Oh, headache, 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 headache. And I'll tell you a very short story. So. Um, one of the th I remember I remember coming back from the UK after the award in, in Dubai. So I was in Dubai coming back to the, yeah, to the UK and um, and I was asked us to visit um, Parliament and then to Downing Street where I was going to meet the, the, the ministers of schools and the prime ministers. So I met I met them both and then I, I went to meet the minister of schools. And one of the interesting things which he said to me, and I think, you know, sometimes as a as a teacher, we have and as a woman, I think we have those kind of moments where we think, actually, I need to be brave and do the right thing. I was offered the opportunity to be um, a, a recruitment, the, the cover girl of teaching when I won for the UK. I was I was offered the opportunity to be um, the person which is going to say, come and join teaching It's the best job in the world. And I was asked that. And then um, but I decided to turn it down. And the reason why I turned it down was because I felt that um, if my government are the first are the government that always pushes the arts to the side is the government that always um, prevents schools from offering a really rich art curriculum. 
a government which only supports a certain type of subject, then why would I do that? And so as a result of that, what I did was I said, what, let, what can I do to help the arts in education? And as a result, I've started a charity called Artists in Residence. And, um, you know, when you feel that you've done the right thing, this is such the best, the most right thing in my life that I've done. I've had two kids, by the way, but this is better. No, I'm joking. Um, Artists in Residence is an organisation which brings artists into schools so that they can inspire the young people. They can upskill teachers by carrying out small projects. And these, the, um, what we do, we, we help schools by matchmaking, all, as it were, um, artists with the schools, which, and we pair them together, they design a project, and all of these projects are in the most depri deprived schools in England. And um, we started last year, so uh, last academic year, we delivered 29 residencies, which is amazing. Um, and this year, our numbers, just before COVID, was almost double that. So um, I'm really proud of this. I think that this is really changing lives. I know it's changing lives. And this just goes to show that actually, you know, we can, once teachers put our minds to it, there's nothing that we can't achieve. So I, I run my charity as well as teach um, as well. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's quite a challenge. But at the end of the day, when you're feeling you're doing the right thing and you're, and, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, I don't think there's a, a greater feeling than that. And just to finish off my presentation, I, you know, I just want to kind of reflect on a couple of things. I want to reflect on the fact that um, throughout my teaching career, I have learned so much from colleagues, from parents, but most importantly, from the young people. And there's moments that has changed my life. And most of those moments are learning from what our young people are showing to us. And I just want to just prove to you the fact that, you know, if you know that your subject is doing amazing work that is changing lives, that the lives of young people, then tell us, showcase it, be proud, don't keep it to yourself. Because as far as I'm concerned, we are changing lives and we are helping our young people flourish. And my question to you before I, we, we put on this link is, what would happen if music wasn't in this young person's life? Rachel, whenever you're ready. Andrea, just while I'm setting up this video, um, just to say this is kind of the final opportunity. If you've got any um, questions for Andrea when she finishes her talk, um, you'll ha we'll have a moment at the end to, to ask Andrea some questions. Andrea and I are just going to mute our microphones as well now because that will help us um, with the quality of the video. Welcome to America's Got Talent. What's your name? I'm Cody. Hi, Cody. I'm Cody. I am 22 years old. Yeah. Who are you, miss? Who are you? I'm mom. Oh, I'm hi, Tina mom. Lee. Hi, hi Tina. How hi. are you? What are you going to do here for us today? I'm going to sing a song for you on the piano. I love it. Tina, tell us a little bit about Cody. Cody is blind and autistic. Oh. Wow. We found out that he loved music really early on. He listened and his eyes just went huge. And he started singing. And that's when I just, I was in tears because that's when I realized, oh my gosh, he's an entertainer. So, yeah. <laughs> Come on, Cody. Come on. in my life and time I've sung a lot of 
songs and I made some bad rhymes. I reckon I'm alive in stages. Ten thousand people watching, yeah. And we're alone now. And I'm singing the song. Also, a new mom this year. And congratulations. It's the toughest job I've ever had and the most rewarding job I've ever had. You just want to give your kids the moon, the stars, and the rainbows. And tonight, I'm going to give you something special. I'm every mountain, and swim every just to be with you Do you want the reason? Cody Lee, you have got the golden buzzer from Gabrielle Union. You will be going all the way to the live shows in Hollywood. tissues if anybody needs any oh how amazing right how absolutely amazing how how incredible was that moment for that young person and that was through the power of music um and i just want to just take again a few seconds at right now at the end just to say thank you again once for everything you're doing we are we are heroes what you're doing is changing the lives and you are making a huge difference now and I know that our world has been turned upside down. It may never be the same, you know, for a long, long time. Um, but but what gives me that warmth, that glowing um, feeling is the fact that our children will be running to come back to school. They'll be running to come back to your classroom environment. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, I need a tissue, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much andrea um wonderful and i think i'm i'm getting quite emotional as well me and my colleagues have been reading the chat and the comments coming through have just been incredible oh, as well. um oh. i am going to take a few moments now just to to give you some um some questions that have come in if that's okay andrea <laughs> i need to uh, compose myself a little bit um okay let's start i think let's start with this one i think just picking up from what you were just talking about during this time this strange world that we're all living in right now and those you know trying to keep our connections with young people when we're teaching online rosa has asked um how we can encourage people or young learners to learn more so i suppose maybe if you could share with us some of your experiences of how you're trying to, I suppose, encourage children that you're not with every day at the moment. 
Absolutely. So, Rosa, um, in my school, it's quite strange because we've actually been teaching exactly the same type of lesson through Google Classroom. So if they've had history period one, then maths and arts, then I would be his third, the, the third lesson. But what I've had to do is just think the fact that actually this child is going to be sitting in front of the computer for seven hours a day. It's not healthy. What what could be fun? What could I do? And what I'm trying to do is make my lessons interesting, fun, um, trying to move them away from the computer whereby they can do other things just to keep their, their well-being intact. Um, and the other challenge, obviously, that this brings to you is the fact that um, the resources which they may have at home may not be appropriate, which, again, gives out the edit, it gives me that, that extra kind of pressure. What can I do? How can I, how can I make their experience of art still be engaging um, and make them want to come to my lesson? Uh, what I've done is I've done things like um, I've, I'm doing more photography courses. So I'm, I'm teaching them more about photography and having a look at projects which they can quickly do, which shouldn't be cost effective. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think outside the box. Can they go into their garden? Um, can, they, can they create um, art out of food? What can they do? So really changing that what could be a very boring learning diet. And my problem is that once we lose their engagement, once we lose them from connecting with us through whatever methods you have at school, um, it's gonna be a huge challenge for us to get them back on. So um, the more we keep in contact, the more we keep, they, they know that we're there, I think that's gonna be really helpful. Another question um, from Jessica, Andrea. Jessica's asking how we can incorporate creativity and expression into core subjects and still satisfy the expectations of, of parents and I suppose school management. I know this is something that you and I have spoken about a lot before as well. Yeah, I mean I, I I'm not sure where I'm not sure where everything has been so segregated. I'm not sure where maths is in that box and science is in this box and English. I don't I mean the beauty about arts is that it's everywhere culture is everywhere um there's music in there's there's maths in music there's maths in art there's maths there's science in art um it's that we what we probably need to start doing is coming together as different subject leads and trying to think about curriculums whereby um, our young people can incorporate everything they can be doing art projects alongside science alongside pe alongside dance alongside food you know so it's not segregated it's one big project community whereby they're learning skills but I think for me it's about their learning skills which will be useful for them that they can then apply that that would be a great world wouldn't it yeah absolutely and finally I'm going to kind of come to this question and um, actually this is two questions for you and um, that I'm going to kind of put together Andrea and um, first of all um, one of the teachers Begonia Regalado um, was saying that the talk was really interesting but I'm, I'm assuming that Begonia teaches a lot of different classes because she's asking about how she can make connections with 200 students. So I'm assuming that she's teaching a lot of different classes. And then also Alejandro, and I suppose this links, Alejandro is asking, in your experience, what's the best way to establish that student-teacher link? Um, being it would be quite difficult to you know learn the lives of every single student that you have in your classroom so yeah you you will have 200 children uh, it'll be diff it'll be very difficult to learn you know what their favorite favorite teams is and whatever but um, i think it's showing an interest just being open present asking questions um trying to connect with them could it be something very small um how was your evening how was your weekend that that just shows that you care and that just encourages conversation. So um, I'm hoping I'm hoping that more or less answers those two questions because it is a huge task for me. I find that the more I know about my students, the know the more I can find that ways of unblocking any issues which they have in their learning or any or um, helping them just to kind of put them on the right track. Um, every school is different. Every community is different. Um, this has worked for me. This fits my personality really well. I don't expect people to change, you know, their way they're they're teaching or change their personalities. You know, it's it's not about that. I just think it's a, a case of just being more aware who is in front of you, who are you trying to inspire. 
Thank you so much, Andrea. I think, I mean, I could say um, a lot now. Actually, the way I want to end this um, is actually just by, I've just picked out amongst so many of the amazing comments in the chat box for you. Um, I just wanted to finish on this one from Donatella, who said, the more I listen to Andrea, the more I think this is an amazing opportunity, sharing visions and get, getting inspired oh. by other teachers. That's fantastic. Oh. Um, so and honest, honestly, I, I, I could go on. There've been so, so oh. many. And um, Maria Ampero as well said, the more I teach and work with young people, the more I, the more I learn and the more I'm joyful. Um, mm -hmm. So I think what you've done, as I, I hope, and I really think so, and definitely for me, I think you reminded us all um, of those, just kind of the reasons why we became teachers and um, the importance of what we're doing. So Andrea, thank you so much once again. It's been an absolute delight to have you here with us today. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in this afternoon. Um, God bless you. God keep you safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we go, guys, um, I just want to remind you of some resources that we've got. And I know that my colleagues are about to share this PDF in the chat box for you. OK, uh, the Cambridge Life Competencies Framework um, is really related to a lot of the things that Andrew has been talking about today. Creativity, critical thinking. Um, we'll pop that link into the PDF for you if you'd like to find out more about that. Uh, Cambridge in Casa, obviously we are the Iberian market. We're based here in, um, I'm based here in Madrid. We're going to share with this with you this link uh, where you can find lots of different resources for teachers, parents and students. And finally, where you can register for your certificate of attendance today. So again, this link you'll find in your PDF. Um, and you can register for your certificate there. Don't forget, we'll be back next Monday. We've got Nick Bilbra sharing his story of the uh, of his sorry award-winning charity, the Hands Up Project. Richard Gerver, the award-winning speaker, the week after, and finally Ed Fido, uh, co-founder of School Twenty One, for our final session. It just leaves me to say thank you once again so much to Andrea. Thank you for being with us and really hope to see you soon. If not over the internet, face to face. <laughs> I hope. My, I, honestly, this has just been wonderful. I had a lovely afternoon. Thank you so much, Rachel, for organising it. And thank you to everyone who tuned in again. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for everyone for attending. I hope to see you soon. Bye.